You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitate at support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Carol Hooven teaches in and co-directs the undergraduate program in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. She earned her BA in psychology from Antioch College in 1988 and her PhD at Harvard in 2004, researching sex differences and testosterone and has taught at Harvard ever since. She has received numerous teaching awards and her hormones and behavior class was named one of Harvard's Crimson Top 10 Tried and True. We talked to Carol today about her recent book, T, The Story of Testosterone, The Hormone That Dominates and Divides Us. We also talked to Carol about some of the complicated and difficult social consequences she's faced from writing and speaking about biology during a very heated cultural climate. Here's our conversation with Carol. Hi, Sasha. How are you? I'm great, Stella. How about you? I'm very well. Um, I'm very excited today uh, because we have a great guest and it's a guest. Um, I've read your book. It's Carol Hooven, Dr. Carol Hooven, I should say. And uh, I read her book. It's fascinating. I reviewed it for the Evening Standard and it's it's such an enlightening, powerful, informative book. And I was so excited when when uh, Carol agreed to come on the show with us. I really think today we can give a really, really good analysis of the impact of testosterone on the body. And that's it. That's all we need to kind of really, really kind of uh, learn about. Because when you learn about testosterone, you stand back after after I, I thought I knew my stuff. But after I read that book, I went, oh, my God. Oh my God, this is a hormone to be reckoned with. I do, I do want to read a book about oestrogen <laughs> and find out about that, but that's another day's work. So you're very welcome, Carol. Thank you so much for having me on. It is such a pleasure. I'm a huge fan of the podcast and I'm so delighted to meet you both. Thank you. So can you remind us the title of your book and maybe launch us into um, what the audience needs to know about this book? Sure. The title of the book is, in the USA anyway, is T, The Story of Testosterone, the Hormone That Dominates and Divides Us. And I'll just say the title um, outside of the US is Testosterone, The Story of the Hormone That Dominates and Divides Us. And a good place to start would be the jungles of Western Uganda. And that's where I first really began to become interested in testosterone. So there's another long story about how I ended up in observing and researching chimpanzees in Uganda. But once I was there, I was really just there trying to get some research experience and trying to learn more about the evolutionary origins of human behavior. And chimpanzees, along with bonobos, are our closest living relatives. So this was an incredibly valuable opportunity, and it was a way for me to try to get into a Harvard graduate program in biological anthropology. And I was supposed to be there for a year, but my time was cut short because there was some pretty severe violence going on in that region of Africa, and that was somewhat of a scary and difficult environment to be in. But then inside the forest, there was also a lot of violence going on. And that was really exciting and fascinating and sometimes also very disturbing. And overall, my days with the chimps, if there were female, if I was just with female chimps and no males present, I could count on a pretty relaxed day relative to the days I would spend following the males around the jungle, you know, hiking and um, following them through their days with sleeping, eating, fighting. Can I say fucking? (laughs) Because it just (laughs) goes along with the Fs. Can I ask, were you there to study testosterone or did you end up studying testosterone? No, no. 
I went, when I went out uh, to Uganda, I had really no real research experience. I wasn't, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school to learn about the evolutionary origins of human behavior. But beyond that, I really didn't know anything about testosterone. I had, you know, read some books and taken some classes, but never anything on endocrinology. And it wasn't even really aggression per se that I was interested in. I just got this opportunity to get some field experience and snapped it up. I couldn't believe it. This was with, um, I had read a book by the professor at Harvard, who's a primatologist, who ran that uh, research site, and I was just dying to try to do some work with him at his, um, you know, anything I could do to get to know him and research techniques, and I got offered this opportunity. And I ended up getting evacuated from the area after eight months because there were some increasing threats of violence, uh, and the area that I was in was coming under increasing threat. So I was only, so I was there for eight months, but when I was with the females, it was really peaceful relatively to the males. It was peaceful. And there was a lot of moms with their little kids and their their families, sometimes two or three kids even. And the, um, it could be one or two moms traveling together, but usually one mom and her kids. And, um, I could just sit and watch them playing and nursing, and it was generally very quiet. And when I'd be with the males, especially when there were females present who were in estrus, that means they were able to get pregnant, it was much different. So anytime the big males were around, the dominant males, and especially with estrus females, yeah, there was a lot of excitement and sex and aggression, because anytime there's a female who can get pregnant, there will be male-male aggression. That is how males increase their reproductive success, the number of kids that they can produce over a lifetime. And natural and especially sexual selection shape males to physically and behaviorally to engage in behaviors that allow them to ascend the status hierarchy so that they can have more mates and basically more sex and more offspring. And especially in chimps and a lot of uh, male animals, physical aggression is one of the ways to do that. It's one of the most important ways. So I saw these differences in um, female behavior and male behavior, and in particular, in one day that I was out there, I saw something that really blew my mind. And that was the dominant male was off in a clearing with one of my favorite females, Utamba, and her two little kids, a baby and a three-year-old. And um, they were sitting on a log in a clearing. Normally, I should say Imoso, who was the dominant male, would not have been away from the bigger party of chimps just with one female alone. And she wasn't even an estrus. But sometimes the males will go off with the females for various reasons. And I found out why he did this, because they were off in this clearing. It was peaceful. She was grooming him. And I was just, you know, leaning back against a fig tree, taking notes and everything, you know, it was just, this was a great scene to be able to be watching. And suddenly she started screaming her head off. The chimps scream sometimes, but this was, they scream a lot actually, um, make these vocalizations, but she was screaming out in fear and pain as he started to beat her pretty severely. And that was unusual. The male, the big male chimps will kind of slap and harass the females to kind of try to keep them in line. But this was, ended up being a prolonged and pretty severe beating that involved Utamba just trying to protect her baby so that her baby didn't get hurt while, while she was getting, sorry, while she, while she was getting um, beat up and... I can see it's really moving. And Sorry. I remember reading about it. It was so powerful. I think it was something like nine minutes. The, the male It was chimp. nine minutes. And, yeah. and obviously, so right now I'm just thinking about, you know, it doesn't just happen in chimps. It happens in humans. And moms are trying to protect their kids. Me too. I'm thinking that. And when you it's said not, she tried to protect yeah. her baby, it just yeah. felt so human. Because we all so know that's that. how it struck me. Today. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. yes. So that's how it struck me. That doesn't mean that this that human 
you know, men can't control their actions. I just want to be clear about that. Mm. And it doesn't even mean that it's the same evolutionary reasons. Um, however, it is impossible not to make that connection, right? They, so this went on for nine minutes. Can I ask, yes. did you ever figure out why he suddenly turned on her? Yes. And I'm, I, yes. And I'll tell you, but I want to tell you what happened. He, he, beat her with his fists. He kicked her. He hung from a branch and kicked her as he was hanging from the branch. And he picked up a stick and started beating her, using the stick as a weapon to beat her over her head and her back. And they, um, somebody wrote a story on this in Time magazine entitled Wife Beaters of Kibali. So, of course, they anthropomorphize mm-hmm, this event, mm-hmm. but anyone could see that there are parallels to human behavior. But the point is, this is information that we can use to try to understand the roots of similar kinds of violence in humans. But what's disturbing is for people to think that maybe there are evolutionary roots, and maybe there is something in our biology that can help to explain this, that is both disturbing and powerful information. And so it wasn't just that incident, but that was pretty formative to me. But it was in the context of seeing these sex differences in behavior every day and levels of aggression and nurturing, and then also being in Uganda and having to get evacuated because there were threats to people in my area. They, people were in fact being white people and, and Ugandans were being um, beheaded and hacked up uh, by people with machetes that was happening. And I was in an area where that was happening. So I had to get evacuated. So of course I, internalized some of the human violence at the same time I'm kind of watching this in the Mm. forest. And it just got me intensely curious about the biological underpinnings of human sex differences, not just violence, but really all kinds of sex differences. So then when I finally did get into Harvard, I had to apply a second time. Um, That's what I wanted to study was testosterone and sex differences. And that's what I ended up doing. And I stayed on at Harvard to teach instead of do research. And, um, and then I just uh, finally wrote a book about it. What was the, 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 the factor that kind of made him attacker? I shouldn't say made him attacker, but what was it? Yeah. So research on chimpanzees now shows that, the when a female takes a lot of physical abuse from a particular male, he is more likely to father children by her. So it's, in essence, his way of keeping her sexually available to him in the future. So what was weird is that she wasn't in estrus then. Normally, the males will fight each other. When a female is in estrus, they get very aggressive with each other. And they can even get aggressive with the female a little bit in that situation just to get her to be compliant. But in this case, it is, Imoso was basically saying, you will be mine in the future. And he was the dominant male. And he did, in fact, sire the most offspring. And she was one of the most fertile um, females. So that seems to be the case there that it's an evolutionarily shaped strategy in chimpanzees. And we don't know, there are so many factors, of course, in humans. And one thing that, of course, affects the expression of male aggression is the environment and what are the, you know, laws and what are the norms in a particular society. We can look around the world and see that domestic abuse varies like crazy across the globe because it's tolerated more in some places than others. So this isn't to say that, you know, we have no control over anything. That's true, but you would say that mostly domestic abuse is male perpetrating on female. You you could say that that is a you know what I mean? A true okay, so this is a little tricky and, and sensitive also because, um, yes, the most severe uh, injuries are caused by men, by far. The homicides, uh, interpersonal violence, homicides and, and, and severe injuries are perpetrated by men. Women commit a fair amount of physical assaults against their partners. However, it seems to be more often in uh, defense of their themselves or their kids. But women can also commit sort of lower levels of, uh, and do commit lower levels of physical assaults that don't result in as severe injuries also. And that really doesn't get a lot of attention where there are, you know, are male victims who are sometimes reluctant to even report 
uh, abuse by their female partners. I'm really struck by something that's bringing up memories for me of when I used to work with domestic violence victims, obviously human victims. And a lot of women used to say that the the psychological and physical abuse used to break them down and make them feel like they couldn't have a life without this person. And it's shocking to hear you say that when anthropologists or primatologists study this in chimps, that's kind of what's happening. That the male well, chimp it's is fear. Like it's breaking, fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just kind of instilling this terror, terror to leave, and it's incredibly yes. parallel to what happens in highly abusive, violent relationships. Yeah. And there are the parallels, you know, but of course we have to be really careful about assigning cause because we're not chimps. We have these complex social systems, but there is a pattern that exists all over the world of men using this particular strategy to control, ultimately to control female sexuality Mm -hmm. and to be, you know, to monitor where their uh, partners go to, prevent them from straying, to punish them for perceived infidelity, et cetera. And I don't know as much about the what happens psychologically, but I do understand that a lot of the time women's psychological defenses are broken down and they mm. have no they don't have support even sometimes, right? You know more about how that works though. Um, but to and that, me, that's what makes our conversation yeah. very interesting because you've got the biology and we've hopefully got the psychology. <laughs> <laughs> right. That, that's why right. It's, it's, it's so that's why it's so important for me and to be informed, because it's so easy for me. I've often said it that I like whenever my kids are sick and all that, I, I only ever see the psychology and we've got right. to. <laughs> As they're vomiting right. in the corner, I'm asking, are they stressed? Right. <laughs> they're like, no. So uh, um, I think but, it's yeah. important we bring in the biology, that it, it impacts yeah. us. Yes. And just, I want, I want to just close the testosterone loop because testosterone is a hormone and it's a reproductive hormone, just like estrogen. And reproductive hormones shape our bodies and behavior in ways that help us as individuals, as male and female mammals, maximize reproduction. So like, for instance, estrogen, well, ultimately, both hormones help us to convert energy into offspring. That's what uh, reproductive hormones do. They help to coordinate all these systems. And so estrogen, as you probably have noticed, converts energy, it biases energy deposition into fat, right? And converting energy into fat over muscle. And there's a reason for that. That's for reproduction. We female mammals need to use our bodies to reproduce. Male mammals never have to use their bodies to gestate and nurse the offspring. They get us to do that, or, or we um, p- basically do that for them. So we have to, we need the energy and fat. In order for them to have reproductive opportunities, they need more muscle. And they And that was much more important in our evolutionary history because muscle helps them compete for mates and that helps them reproduce. So testosterone biases the conversion of energy into muscle over fat. Those are reproductive strategies. And so testosterone and estrogen shape the way we develop physically, obviously in terms of our reproductive physiology, developing it, maintaining it, running it, you know, promoting sperm production, promoting egg production, but also the ways that we need to behave um, are also really important. We have to be able to want want to use our bodies to take care mm-hmm. of our offspring. Mm-hmm. We have to want to nurse our kids. That has to be pleasurable, and estrogen has a role in that. And testosterone helps to motivate males to compete and use their muscles and their sperm and their penis. And if they didn't have those effects on their brain, all that those other effects would be useless. I'd love to ask you a question because I've heard some um, evolutionary biologists talk about the fact that in, in human primates, that males have also evolved to learn how to be cooperative leaders. Um, and, and I'm wondering if you can comment on that, because it seems like there are multiple things here that on a level might seem contradictory, but I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you think about that. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Um, And I just also want to say everything I'm saying is on average and not all males are super competitive and not all women are nurturing. And so that's really um, important. And of course, 
human males act also as fathers and have paternal investment, which we don't see in, we don't see in 95% of other mammals. Um, now, you just asked about uh, sort of pro, so what might be considered pro, pro-social behaviors or cooperation. So if you look at chimps, what's really interesting, even the cooperation, when the males do really compete, it's to defend their territory against groups of other males. So wh- where else do we see that? Hmm. Okay. So we obviously see that in humans also, but they're not just defending their territory because that's just where they like to live. They're defending their territory because the more territory they have, the more females they can have in that territory because females need access to the food resources on the territory that's being guarded. We see that in all kinds of mammals. I talk about red deer in the book. You have a male with a harem, but he needs to defend a particular territory so the females he's holding can have enough food, basically grass, whatever it is that they're, they need for their own reproductive success. So for males to work together to defend a territory benefits that group of males who are cooperating because they all have increased access to female mating opportunities, even if they're going to compete over that, those opportunities when they arise. So they don't like beat the crap out of each other when Mm. they're competing for those mating opportunities, it's kind of lower level aggression, but when they compete with males in a neighboring territory, they will rip their balls off, mm-hmm. literally pin them down and rip their balls off. And, uh, be, it's not, it seems like torture and then kill them. Um, wow. so that they're not playing around. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and how- so we see that in humans, males can com- males do cooperate more quickly and they will resolve conflicts more quickly and having clear status hierarchies benefits males in a way that they can sort out their conflicts quickly. They know who's dominant. They know who's subordinate. They can signal that. They can pick up on those signals. They can play a bunch of strangers can get together and play a basketball game. And it's like no big deal. That's unusual in women. Women seem to take longer to work out their relationships, to forgive each other, you know, to reconcile. Males have these systems in place. You can get in a fight there's a winner, there's a loser, it's sorted and they forgive and each can, other and, and move on. Can I can I kind of wonder aloud about, I know an awful lot of fe- feminism is, is very <laughs> against leadership and hierarchies and men do seem more um, comfortable as in, that's top dog, that's second dog, that they're, they're, they're kind of, they find the, it seems they find the roles of there's a leader and we follow them easier than perhaps females. That's my own kind of, no. Yeah, no. And that, I think that that's true. And there's sort of controversy in the field of anthropology about the extent to which our ancestors had strict hierarchies or whether societies were largely egalitarian or whether it was a mix. So in terms of our kind of inherited biology, it's really not clear, but it does seem that uh, it was probably the males who had more power, but it's it's hard to kind of work these things out, you know, from fossils. So uh, yeah. we have to study extant hunter gatherers, et cetera. But I think that question about leadership style and what is most effective is really, really interesting. Um, I'd yeah, like but to I don't sh- have the bottom line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if only we did. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'd love to shift gears a little bit and ask you, I know you wrote a few chapters in your book about gender, I, well, not about gender identity per se, but about transition, right? And the yeah. kind of medical interventions that aim to alter, change, or pause uh, human sex hormones. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, what you discovered there and um, why did it feel important to write those chapters. I mean, it feels like obviously right now it would be impossible to ignore, but I'm just curious if you could talk more about yeah. that. So there's one chapter on sexual orientation and one chapter on uh, transitions and the role of hormones and gender transitions. So there are two reasons why I focused on gender transitions. One is just super illuminating about the power, massive power of testosterone. People don't really understand uh, because if you're male, you're just kind of you don't experience changes in testosterone that you can kind of sense throughout your life. Maybe you you go through puberty, but you go through a male puberty and that's that. And then you have high testosterone and you're kind of already conditioned uh, with 
the effects of high testosterone. So you don't really notice it. And, and females just know what the men in their lives are like. However, uh, what better population to look at and to examine the research on, uh, other than people who have changed their transat, their testosterone levels massively and sort of cross that line to what it might be like somewhat to live as the opposite sex. So, and I, so I interviewed for the book and I really explored the liter- the scientific literature uh, very deeply. I interviewed a male to female transitioner, a female to male and a female to male and back. So a detransitioner. I also interviewed Sasha, who is a person who is non-binary, who was born male and goes by Sasha as pronouns and was just starting puberty blockers. Okay, interesting. And so you you had these range of experiences uh, of different people who had, you know, gone through testosterone changing procedures. So what, what did you discover? Yes. Okay. So the re- sorry, you had asked me why I wanted to cover this particular topic. And I said there were two reasons. And so one is because it's really a incredibly powerful way to learn about the effects of testosterone. And two is because I wanted to provide a resource for trans people who are taking testosterone, blocking testosterone, detransitioning, and trying to come to terms with their you know, remaining facial hair or uh, deep voices. And I wanted to provide as much detail as I could about the effects of testosterone on their bodies, on their behavior, and the effect, the extent to which they're permanent and why they might be permanent. So that was my second goal there was really to provide a resource. But in terms of what I did learn about the main effects, so you guys already know about all this. Um, But what was really powerful to me was to hear people's personal stories, especially about how changing testosterone changed their sexual natures, changed their sex drives, changed their urgency for sex. And something maybe you guys can talk about, um, sometimes changed the target of their sexual attraction. So I don't know how that works or why, uh, someone who say was a born female and had lived as a lesbian and then starts taking testosterone. And and I talk about this, this is what someone talked about in the book. And then she became attracted to men. Um, and I also had someone who, um, changed the target of their sexual attraction who went from male to female. And so that I thought was interesting and I don't have any answers for that, but what but the most powerful change it seemed was, and this happened even before the physical changes. So if for the um, female to male person who had been sort of a person who had, she hadn't actually had a lot of sexual experience, but she described having what she thought was a typical female sex drive and also somebody who was fairly emotional and would cry regularly uh, and experience the full range of emotions, etc. And then after she transitioned, she described having an ex- the her sexual urge just kind of going through the roof, experiencing something like a male puberty, which I now have a much better understanding of. And it increased actually my kind of compassion for young men who are going through puberty or, or who feel that their sexual urges are so strong that it's difficult for them to learn how to navigate them and to interact with women in a way that's respectful and non objectifying. And that is what the transitioners described that they had been living as women and did not like being objectified, then started feeling the urge to do that. So that I found to be mind blowing. This isn't all about culture. It's not all about patriarchy. It's not all about men being assholes. There's part of that, of course, especially if you you know, give in to those urges, but the nature itself, the impetus for these behaviors, I don't think we can blame people for their nature. You know, we want to mold behavior 
We can certainly blame people for that and hold people accountable for that. But I really came to understand that this nature that women don't really understand, it's not that we don't get super horny too, but it, it's a different, seems to be of a different quality. So it made me really curious about male sexuality and the struggles that men face. And maybe the more information we have, the more discussions we can have, the less shaming we can do, the better able, able will be to, we will be to really support and educate men in terms of coming to terms with these, you know, urges that they have. So that was sort of interesting for me. And I should and also say that. So, yeah, go ahead. It feels it feels so controversial. It it feels also for me intuitively what I had kind of gleaned from the difference between male and and, and female. That so, so often I had realized that they, and I, I know I, I I'm at risk of annoying it everybody but that it feels that it was in their nature they didn't mean it that they were doing it reflexively you know what I mean men who did whatever if you follow me and then you learn about testosterone and you think oh it was in their drive it was in their hormonal drive you know and yet just because it's in our nature it's how you nurture the nature really isn't it exactly I mean so that's the whole point is that we have clear evidence that the way that people act on their natures is heavily molded by culture and society and upbringing and family and peers and institutions so that's the important point is how significant nurture is. That doesn't mean that the sex differences that we observed are caused by uh, nurture or or the environment or culture, right? But it means they can be significantly molded. That's the point that we have to focus on is the power of the environment to shape the expression of our natures, particularly the darker parts of our natures. And that's what I have learned. That's like the number one point I think I've learned from all of this research is, yeah, biology is at the root of the differences in our natures, but the environment is uh, like everything in terms of how we express them. Um, and just to, just to go back to the trans stuff, the I just want to say that going in the opposite direction from male to female, um, people had the kind of expected changes also before the physical changes of a dampening of that sex drive, an increase in emotional expression, and sort of being in touch with the full range of emotions. I found I hadn't really understood that before. And I found that really interesting. And I should say these effects are all really variable, you know, but these are what we see on average. These are what the people I interviewed happened to say. And it was totally consistent with mm -hmm. what I found in the literature. Mm. It makes me wonder about something because like some young people that I work with seem to think that our bodies are like this completely neutral vessel and you can just kind of decide what hormone mix you'd like, you know, and people who are transitioning may think, well, you know, if I have to, you know, have a body, I prefer to have the female hormones or I prefer to have the male hormones. And while of course, studying people who transitioned is really fascinating because it gives us a glimpse into the power of these hormones. I wonder is, is that way of thinking about it you know, scientifically accurate that we can just kind of swap in and out hormones based on what preferences we have? Or like, are there, are there consequences to that? I mean, I'm asking almost to, in a little facetious way here, but like there are, there are consequences to um, being biologically of one sex and then putting your body through this kind of hormonal wash of the other sex. Oh, I think I know. I see what you're asking. So you, you're saying sometimes people with gender dysphoria have, and correct me if I'm wrong, very strong feelings about their bodies and want to take hormones, want to adjust their hormones in ways that will bring their bodies more in line to who they feel themselves to be. But maybe they're not thinking carefully or don't understand quite the enormity of the psychological and emotional and even personality changes that they will experience when they change their hormones and biological changes. Right. So I guess what I'm asking is like, even though we can change somebody's um, body to some degree, let's say by putting a female person on testosterone, are there contraindications between having a female body and also taking your hormone, your T hormone levels to the level of a male bodied person? Like, are there 
consequences there with health impacts. It's almost like, Sasha, uh, as far as I can gather, and certainly it's young people I've met, they, they see themselves as this kind of blank slate to which they can en- put in hormones and create the kind of the mix of gender that they, they want to be. And it's an extraordinarily chemical way of, of looking at yourself. But it's more and more common. I know it sounds shocking, Carol, but it, it is more and more common. It feels like these are very kind of digitally kind of influenced kids who just think, no, I just have to put in a little bit of, my, of testosterone and I will just be a little bit masculine and then I'll do. And it's, they're, they're, they're literally chemicalizing their identity. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, no, I think that I, I understand the drive, I think, to do that, to really feel yourself to be maybe, you know, non-binary, but maybe a little bit more masculine, not quite male, but more masculine. So you just need a little bit of testosterone or a little bit of estrogen. And that's tricky. That is tricky because we don't really have enough research on what the physical and psychological outcomes there will be. And we, it sounds like it would be exceedingly difficult for that mix of hormones to really do the trick to, to allow you to live out your fantasy. It just, I don't, I don't have the papers that I could cite you, but it's hard to imagine how that could not be somehow disappointing ultimately. But I, I don't know enough to speak with authority about that, but I do know that these horn that you, that's not, uh, uh, yeah, I think we need a lot more research. I think you're saying, it just seems so unpredictable to me what the outcomes would be physically and mentally. And there's such powerful effects that it seems that the monitoring, you know, of the outcomes would have to be so intense. And I just think you don't want to set up expectations that can't be met through yeah. altering your chemicals in that way. I remember one piece in your book that really stood out. You did a really good, I have to commend you on how you dealt with I know people call them DSDs, developmental sex disorders or developmental sex disorders. Differences of sexual, differences or disorders of uh, sexual development. Yeah. And some people back in the day, it was called intersex very often. But I remember you you really got into that in the book. And one, one, one piece really stuck out. It literally, you know, when something lodges in your head, like what? Because what it was, was some people, I said, there's something like 46 or something DSDs, different types. There's lots of different types of DSDs that you can have, whether you're male or female. You're born, let's say, male, but you might have a DSD. So you might have, you know, differences that other people who aren't born with a DSD might have. But you said that the females, there's one in 15,000 um who have CAS, as far as I remember. Congenital, adre- congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH. CAH, yes. Yes, yes. And if you have CAH, so it's only about 1 in 15,000 females who will have it. But if you have CAH, you're going to have more testosterone was, in your, was, was given to you as a fetus in the womb. And if you have this condition, you're more likely to have male-oriented jobs like carpenters and plumbers, and you're yeah. more likely to earn more money. Yeah. More I likely said, to be a lesbian. Yeah. Which plumbers, so which plumbers are yeah. earning so much money? I'd like to be. Plumbers do pretty well. Plumbers do <laughs> very well. <laughs> yeah, no. But you're more likely to have male-oriented Oh, yeah, that's great. More likely to have male-oriented jobs, so I just said carpenters and plumbers, and also yeah. more likely to earn more money. And also, what was the, you, you said, oh, yeah, more likely to be a lesbian. It literally, it lodged in my mind as, yeah. oh, my God. Like, yeah. Oh, my God, that turns everything that I know about life on its head, really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it does address this argument that the that most of the sex differences in behavior that we see are primarily caused by social influences or the part patriarchy. Um, because first of all, we know that just in transgender people, we can see before the physical changes, we see these changes in behavior that mostly that have to do with sex. 
And so we can, first of all, we know from other evidence in animals and experimental evidence in humans, when you block testosterone, your sex drive goes down. So these differences in sexual behavior seem very clearly related to differences in testosterone level. But then you have these other kinds of differences, like the way that boys and girls play. And what's interesting about play is it is practice for adult behaviors, in particular adult reproductive behaviors. You see more nurturing play, relationship-oriented play among girls. You see more, by far, rough and tumble play among boys. They think it's fun, and some girls do that too, and some boys do nurturing play. And we know, especially in gender non-conforming kids who might later grow up to be gay, which is a whole other interesting area. Um, but boys more than girls enjoy pouncing. I have a 12 year old and he's a gentle, sensitive kid, but one of his favorite things has been to do with his friends, just tackle each other, just kind of jump all over each other and be super physical. You just see much, much lower rates of it in girls. And it's not just in Western societies. It's in every culture ever studied. It's also in non-human animals. The little chimps do the same thing. Boy chimps do more of that than girl chimps. Boy rats do more of that than girl rats. The boy rats actually stand up on their hind legs and use their little front paws or whatever you call them to um, box each other. The males do this way more than the females. They It looks like fun, right? So you can manipulate those behaviors in non-human animals by changing the testosterone levels. You block the testosterone, they don't do that. They don't play like boys. In humans, girls who have CAH are much more likely to engage in rough and tumble play. So I should say they are exposed to higher than average levels of testosterone in utero. And usually if they're getting medical care, that condition is corrected at birth. So the only difference between them and other girls is that they had high exposure to androgens in utero. It shaped their brain. Sometimes it causes an enlarged clitoris that can even resemble a penis because testosterone is what you need to grow a penis. So they might have an enlarged clitoris, and sometimes that is surgically uh, reduced. However, the point is that their behavior is masculinized on average relative to girls who don't have it. They want to play with boys' toys. They want to engage in rough and tumble play. They feel more masculine. They grow up to be more likely to be attracted to the more feminine. So it's not like there's a nugget in their brain that says you will be a lesbian, you're going to be attracted to women. It, that nugget, I think, or the neural networks say, this is your disposition. You're a little bit more masculine. You're going to be sexually attracted to the more feminine, i.e. female. You're going to be more likely to do that because you yourself feel more masculine. That is my wow. interpretation. But the point is they do grow up to be more like men. I mean, they're still, you know, most of them identify as female. They have a, a higher chance of not identifying as female, but they are more likely to go into professions where they're working with things over people. So this is just something that carries through apparently from the very, very early ages, and it has to do with testosterone exposure. So this, the long story is that maybe it is this prenatal testosterone exposure which is super important in masculinizing behavior before you even get the huge pubertal surge in testosterone. That does other things that have to do with sex um, and sexual development and, and development of the uh, reproductive physiology, et cetera. But you get this clear masculine behavior in childhood way before puberty. Thank it's you. fascinating because I always <laughs> thought I had, I always thought I had way more testosterone than most people and or the most women. And uh, then I, I, I read your book and I realized I've always hated rough and tumble and I just cringe. <laughs> it's so and funny. I, I, it, and my, my girl is so powerful. She's very like me. She's very powerful, very, you know, confident, la, 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 la. And my little boy, is, he's soft and gentle. And by the way, he'll be 12 in two days. He's soft <laughs> oh. and gentle. And yet, and yet. He, li he likes rough and tumble. 
He likes Rob and Tumble. He sounds like it's my like, son. Yeah. He's sounds like a gentle, sweet kid, not very boyish. Yeah. He doesn't like sports, yeah. but he will tackle the crap out of his friends. Yeah. And I'm like, what is that? I hate it. It's like, ah, oh, I just hate it. And I remember when they were very young, just stop mauling me. Go to daddy. Like, no, oh my I God, sound like you because I used to play baseball. Yeah. I was pretty aggressive. I was very outdoorsy, you know, loved to climb yeah. trees. It w- I would never tack. I would just tackling another girl just seemed that was not appealing. <laughs> it just I'm not gonna like roll. Around, it, it had no appeal. When I was in school, I mean, I I also sus- I've suspected for one reason or another that I have higher testosterone levels too. Maybe this is a fantasy <laughs> all women have. <laughs> I don't know why we all think this. right. But I mean, I am kind of like pushy and verbally, I can be kind of aggressive in a group. Like I'm the least quiet woman around usually. But when I was a kid, I used to walk around telling people to punch me in the stomach so that I could show them how strong I my abs were. I did too. And I used to carry around anyone who would let me pick them up. Like it was, yep. I, anyway, but maybe, maybe that is just a... Is that a female dominance hierarchy thing or something else? Could be. Well, no, I mean, you know, females have, we have our own ways of competing, which yeah. aren't the, uh, quite there's as There's a direct. couple of things I want to ask you. One was, I, I got a little bit stuck on the enlarged clitoris and wondered, do they have a much better sex life? And the the, the sex kind of uh, drive of the man seems to be, um, if I'm right, seems to be generally higher and generally more more likely to want variety yes and the female isn't as high generally yeah. and doesn't seek variety is that right no it seeks may seek variety but not to the same extent as men that is yeah that is correct so you would so it is so you might expect girls with cah to show the sexual patterns to be more like men sexually right yeah. something like that. So we don't the the evidence doesn't show that and I think the reason is that uh they're nowhere near the male level of exposure oh, yeah. and I think that you've got to be exposed to a whopping level to have male typical sexuality. So I just want to bring in gay men because I know. Yeah, so do what's I. <laughs> interesting about gay men um one thing that's interesting is that their sexuality is 100% masculine. They're, they just want to have sex with other men, but they want to have sex, you know, like a man, they want to have more sexual variety. Um, and the libido is higher yet. There are some aspects of gay male behavior that are feminized. So the, so because they're more like they're like lesbians are more likely to be overrepresented in male typical professions, gay men are overrepresented in female typical um, professions. That doesn't, you know, and this is just on average. It's not like all gay men are flight attendants. That's not what I'm saying. Um, But there are some differences on average. But what's interesting is there's no evidence that testosterone levels at any point in development or in adulthood are were lower in gay men. And the and I think maybe they just aren't because the sexual behavior is so is totally masculine. And that's what one of the main effects of testosterone is to masculinize sexual behavior. One of the things that you talk about in your book um, is the way the science is being misrepresented. And Stella and I, of course, know doing the work around gender identity that people who are trying to just speak honestly about the science while also offering compassion to a variety of experiences can come under fire. And we're aware that there's been a recent kerfuffle. Is that a fair term? (laughs) Feels like a little more than a kerfuffle, but yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, about what's happening? I know it's probably big and convoluted, but what do we need to understand here? What, what's going on? Yeah, I can talk about this since it just happened. And this is pretty new for me. And it's not that I didn't anticipate getting any blowback from even just writing a book about testosterone and uh, behavior and and sex differences in behavior. You know, that's just controversial right there. Um, But I should just start by saying, to me, knowledge is power. And the more we know about how we work, first of all, it's fascinating, number one. <laughs> and number two, 
You know, like I'm really interested in sexual assault. I've been the victim of sexual assault. I want to know all of the facts that I can, no matter how disturbing they seem to me on the surface. Like if this is an evolved behavior that's testosterone fueled. That's kind of disturbing. You kind of just want to think, no, this is because of the patriarchy and we just have to solve the patriarchy and then sexual assault will go away. Or it makes us feel like we have more control over it or it's not validated. Um, but if the truth is that there is something in our biology that can contribute to the expression of that behavior, I want to have that information. So I guess I'm just want to defend my desire to get to the truth, even when it can be hard to take. And then we have to work with what it means. We have to figure out, is this the best science? Is this really the truth? And then if it is, how, how do we handle that? What are the implications of this reality? Um, and we want to be clear thinkers and be responsible and compassionate. And that's also one of my number one goals is to try to alleviate people's suffering, especially people with all kinds of differences. I have lots of students who are attracted to my classes because I get into the biology of gender differences and maybe they are different or feel different and want to understand that better and they don't want to be patronized. Um, okay, so what happened is I, Katie, Katie Herzog wrote a piece for Barry Weiss's Substack. It was this a, a really great piece of journalism in which she investigated what is going on at medical schools in terms of the teaching around sex and gender. And I think in an effort to be inclusive and supportive of the rights of people with all kinds of differences, especially trans people, uh, educators in response to primarily, I think, pressure from students and activist groups are backing away from using what I consider to be scientifically clear and accurate language like male and female. And uh, she also talked about this trend to move away from using the term women, not using uh, the saying pregnant women, talking about people with uteruses or pregnant people. That, I have to say, that does um, make me somewhat uncomfortable. I don't feel super strongly about the pregnant people issue, but I will die on the hill of, Marin, of male and female. So I went, uh, Fox and Friends asked me on to talk about this. This is a, I would say, you know, conservative news outlet. And I myself am not <laughs> socially conservative. I'm a Democrat and I'm pretty progressive. And however, I'll go anywhere to talk about my book and to talk about my science and what I believe and the values that I want to promote. And, you know, which are like free speech, rights to have open discussions and listen to each other and the value, you know, the scientific tools to understand the world. So I went on Fox News and I talked about my own teaching and what has been happening at Harvard and why I think it's important to use clear terms like male and female. And I said that um, across organisms, males produce small gametes and females produce large gametes. In mammals, that's eggs, uh, sorry, sperm and eggs. And that's clear. And one's sex is based in their biology. But that doesn't prevent anyone from being sensitive and compassionate and supportive of trans rights and using preferred pronouns and being sensitive in healthcare settings. But when it comes to science education of medical students or students in my classroom, I think it's we should stick to using these accurate, clear terms. And if people have issues with that, we should talk about it and talk about the value of um, you know, talk about language and what works and how we can use inclusive language without sacrificing scientific clarity. Um, so I had four minutes on Fox News to talk about this. I did my best. And then what happened was uh, it kind of blew up because someone from my own department thought that that was transphobic and said so and represented and herself as what a... What was transphobic? To, to say to, that... Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because... Um, I asked, so she represented herself as, as the head of the diversity and inclusion task force in our department. 
um, and then said that she was appalled and frustrated. I'm saying this because it's all over the news and it's all over Twitter. It's being covered everywhere in the world. So anyone is, can see what happened and what was said. And she said she was appalled and frustrated at the transphobic remarks. So I t- retweeted her tweet and said, could you please, you know, I, I appreciate your concerns. Can you please let me know exactly what I said that was transphobic? Uh, and I don't, I don't, I, I wasn't, didn't get a clear answer in my view, um, but it kind of blew up. It went viral and it, um, now a big issue in my department. People are trying to, you know, take care of her, uh, because this has been difficult for her. And, um, yes, well, I felt like I was being called out. I was being called out and, um, that, what I said on Fox News, what I said in the piece when I talked about male and female, I also said that educators are backing away from using this kind, using accurate language because they are being shamed on social media. And that's not the right reason for people to alter the language that they're using in science education. We have to do this because of our principles, not because we're out of fear that we're going to be canceled or shamed on social media. So I thought it was important that that is exactly what happened to me in response to saying that the exact thing that I said is the reason people that language is becoming confusing. Science is becoming diluted, even in the scientific journals. And and I want to push back against that trend. I think it's damaging. I don't think that people's opinions or teaching styles should be shaped by fear and shame, but instead by reason and logic and discussion and scientific inquiry. Good for you. I often say, you know, I don't care who's telling the truth. I just care what the truth is, because the truth is, is really what sets us free. Like if we can talk about the truth freely, if we can't talk about the truth freely, well, where are we as a progressive society? It's, it's, it's to me, it's the most important thing that we can do in society. Stella, it, I've thought so much about this and why am I reacting so strongly to this? I was just talking to my husband this morning. Why has this been the thing that I ultimately care about almost more than anything else is free speech. And we had a long talk about that because it's always just been in my gut that this is the most important thing. And and then I was just sort of realized that this is what underlies all of our other rights. Everything. This is how we make social progress. This is how we fight for the other things that I think are so important. It's so important. I completely agree with you. And I did the film uh, Trans Kids, It's Time to Talk in 2018. And honestly, had I not experienced an extraordinary suppression of truth, I don't think I would have got so involved in the world that I've got involved in ever since. It's so compelling when you realize, oh, my God, the truth is being suppressed. And, and I can mis- see why, because it sucks to have it's, people call you names. It's hard to have people investigating all of your actions, scrutinizing every word, call you names and have your life completely disrupted and lose friends. And it's no wonder that people are keeping quiet. Yeah. What has this been like? I mean, I know all of this is really fresh, but what are you are you able or willing to share with us? How, the, how Well, I can just been? say that, you know, um, I understand that some people think that that language is transphobic and that by itself makes me sad. Um, they think I'm transphobic for using that language. And that, that hurts because that's not how I feel at all. In fact, I've dedicated a lot of my teaching and writing to these issues and my students who have these differences and, and they know how much I care about them. And, um, so it's just, that's hard for someone to say that what I'm saying is harming my students, right? So that's just painful because I've devoted my most of my adult life to teaching and because I care about my students really. So can I just clarify when you say the language that I used, was it male and female biology? Was was this the type of language that you use just to clarify? Yes, but I, yes. And I said that the um, one's sex is not based in the feelings in somebody's feelings, it's based in their body. I said something like it's their gametes, but then there's gender identity and gender expression, and we can respect and support all of that. So, um, you know, and I think that pushes back against the idea that one's gender is just whatever you 
or sorry, one sex <laughs> is whatever you say it is. And I think that is ultimately extremely confusing because there's, there's biological sex. And I don't even like to say biological sex because I think that sex is, is biological, but I think we do need to have this ability to recognize that there is our physical bodies are our physical bodies. And then there's how we feel about it and how we express ourselves and how we respond to that. And I think that's what could be perceived as transphobic. And I, 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 just because people are saying that and, and pushing back against that and insulting me in that way, I just don't think that means that I have to say, okay, biology isn't real. Um, mm. that's, I think that's damaging. And but I the, think but it's, the way it's, it, when somebody is silenced, that's when m- m- I think, and that's why we need to speak up. And that's because, what I'm doing, that's why it's but it, so it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. And it's that's why hard. people are not doing it. That's why people don't teach classes like I teach. They don't re- write books like I write. They don't go on Fox News and say what I said because of what is happening to me now. Be, it, it's hard. I'm not sleeping. It's, I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm, you know, it's tough. Uh, and um, I think uh, I know that other people have it much, much, much tougher than I do. You know, we're lost friends left and right. Um, and I think JK you could Rowling, disagree with like, me. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. You could disagree, but I'm not even political. Like I, I don't even feel strong. Sorry, everybody, but I don't feel strongly about it. Like most of these issues, I just feel strongly about the science and being clear about it. That's my number one thing. And, um, no, but pe- yeah, people are going through much, much worse. I've had a tiny taste and it's just uncomfortable and I can't do my work. I'm not even getting back to my students who have like questions about their courses. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's just very disruptive and just sad. You know, it's sad. Well, I mean, we're so grateful that, that not only have you just kind of dedicated yourself to sharing what you've learned about the science, but that you've also kind of tried to stand with confidence in what you've written, um, despite all of this social pressure. And you're right that the power of social shame is tremendous. And I mean, especially as someone who studies primate cultures, like we are an ultra social species. And so what other right, people exactly. think of and us matters yeah. a lot. And it's very, very tough. Yeah. And, you know, as I was sharing with you, Carol, kind of before we started, m- my belief is that it's just a matter of time before this kind of denial of the science catches up with people because our bodies are tangible, they're real, and you, you're really doing a disservice to everybody, whether they're a cis person, a trans person, whether they transition or not, to pretend as though our bodies don't have any real impact and that these hormones are just... Um, like interchangeable, like as though it's very, very uh, easy and it's not going to impact us. So I think that you're you're incredibly brave for just telling telling us these these facts about our bodies. And I think for you know in in years to come, I think you will be sought out as someone to help explain like what happened during the early 2010s and 2020s when we were like not allowed to talk about our biology anymore. Like, I think it's just a matter of time before the ramifications of this come to I light. I just have to say, I mean, there's so many other people who have been doing this for so long and speaking out and are unbelievably brave and who've inspired me. And I have to say, it hasn't been all bad and all hard. I've had a lot of support from people all over the world who are thanking me for speaking out. But it's funny, even that, you know, I have a lot of support, but even just having one or two people who I care about say something negative or support these negative statements that's the really, that's what keeps me up at night is how could this person I thought was smart and knew me and liked me think that this is an okay Do way you to know, behave. I, I've heard so many people say that. Really? That can, yeah, that specific point that um, it's, you know, the people who were, uh, you know, who were, who were in a different kind of place and they were all about identity. Yeah, you can take that. But when it's somebody you know and respect and they turn on you, there's exactly. something so distressing and devastating about that it really yeah. is so but the great part too is people of, yeah great people yeah crawling out. out of the woodwork to to 
say thank you and keep it up. So yeah. that helps. It's too. very much the best of times and the worst of times. Yeah. Well, Carol, we are so grateful that you joined us on the show. I think we could have talked much, much longer, but you've given us such, such a lot of things to think about. And, um, we're, we're really glad that you were able to join. Thank you so much. Sasha and Stella, just thank you so much for having me and for all the work that you you guys are doing. You're wonderful. And again, this is I love your podcast. I get something out of every episode. And thank you. Oh, that means oh, so much. Thank Thanks, you. Carol. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, a Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by Rhyme, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long term care for gender variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.